You're listening to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast, where we tackle some of the biggest questions facing our ocean today by speaking to experts and voices from the world of oceanography. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr. Zoe Jacobs, and today I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Fowl uh, to discuss ocean acidification um, and what corals can tell us about our ocean. So, hello, welcome. It's really good to see you. How are you doing? Great, thanks for having me. I'm doing well, thank you. Good. So we've been starting the podcast with a random ocean question recently, um, and yours is, what is your favourite ocean movie? That's a tough one. I can't think of a favourite one, but I can think of one that upset me deeply. Okay, we'll go, we'll go with that. <laughs> I think it was called 47 Metres Down, oh, and yeah. some girls go in a shark cage, and the cage falls to the floor, and, you know, they supposedly have hours of air and they have this really awful still image of the regulator how much gas is left in their air tank Aww. and I was watching it with some of my scuba diving friends and we sat there doing the calculations of how wrong it all was so <laughs> that, that will stick with me <laughs> yeah I understand I think my favorite is Finding Nemo but yeah I also have quite a few that just stress me out when I watch them <laughs> so I know, I know what you mean <laughs> Captain Phillips on cruise ships oh yeah exactly <laughs> that's another good one <laughs> so I know you've always loved the ocean. Um, so I just wondered if you could tell us a bit about your background and how it led to you becoming um, an oceanographer. So I actually grew up in North Staffordshire, so really far away from the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we used to go on day trips to Blackpool and Land Dudno, and I always enjoyed splashing around in the waves and digging around in the sand. And Sunday evenings was always like a Sunday roast and David Attenborough was normally on the TV. And I just remember always being most captivated by the marine themed ones. I think it was all the colors and the movement. And when you're young, the ocean is such an alien place. You know, you see these creatures that you never see in normal day to day life. So I think that really yeah. captured my attention. And when I was young, I was also fortunate enough to go to SeaWorld. I know it's taboo Ooh. to say that now, <laughs> and I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate it anymore. But genuinely, that trip really changed my life. I was super young, but just seeing all these variety of animals, big ones, small ones, close up, it really ignited a curiosity mm. in me that made me think, well, what are they like? out in the open ocean like when free willy went out yeah, to exactly. see what was his life then so it just made me want to be a marine biologist yeah. and as i was growing up i fell less in love with biology and more in love with chemistry mm -hmm. so i went towards the marine chemistry route and then i kind of got the best of all worlds yeah perfect love that <laughs> um and you've already mentioned it but haven't you been quite a keen scuba diver yes so i was actually 13 when i learned to dive when I was on this mission to become a marine biologist, I thought, oh, how can I get closer to all the creatures in the sea? And logically, of course, my brain was like, oh, you could dive <laughs> and then they'll be right there. And I remember there was a girl at school and she'd learned to scuba dive already. And she was telling me about a local pool that ran free tri dives. So I went and did that. And then the rest is kind of history. I remember doing my open water course in Stony Cove. It's an old quarry. It was February and I was 13 and in a wetsuit that also didn't really fit. And I was absolutely frozen. And it's quite fun to reflect on that now because at the time when I was in this freezing cold quarry, I never ever would have imagined that I'd grow up to be a scuba instructor, a tech diver and all the really crazy places it's taken me to see. I never would have expected that. So yeah it's really nice to look back on the story yeah I bet um and what about your journey to knock what was that like my journey to knock has been quite an interesting circle <laughs> so I first arrived at knock in 2011 with the University of Southampton to do my master's of research in ocean science there I focused on biogeochemistry and pollution and then I stayed on to do a PhD in coral geochemistry so I used the elemental composition of coral skeletons to reconstruct past climate, mm -hmm. so temperature and pH. After I finished my PhD, I took a bit of a break from the academic world and I moved to a small island in Honduras called Utila. And there I trained to be a scuba instructor and I stayed there to work. And then after that, I spent a year in the remote part of the Philippines <laughs> and working for Marine Conservation Philippines. And there I was a research scientist and scuba instructor. 
after that, I was offered a job here at NOC in the Ocean Technology mm -hmm. and Engineering Department. And ironically, I was working on the pH sensor that I'd actually been working on in my Aww. master's project. That's amazing. <laughs> um, but it looked really different because obviously they'd spent an, an extra six yeah. years <laughs> on the development. So yeah, it's been a, a fun circle. So I'm not surprised um, to hear that scuba diving has been um, a huge part of your journey. Um, so you must have some incredible stories. What are your most memorable ones or some of the best, most interesting places that you've been? I've definitely got lots of fun scuba diving stories. Um, some that stick out in particular, uh, there's one in Utila and around the new moon in Utila, um, you get lots of bioluminescence. Mm. So you get all these bright blue flashes of light and they're all around you. And if you're on a night dive, obviously they're just flashing and you can get strings of pearls. So they just come in blobs and lights of so strings of lights. And I was on a night dive on a wreck there called the Halliburton wreck. It's relatively deep. It's about 30 meters, but the wreck is very open mm. at the back. So my friend and I, we were just hanging out where the cargo part of this shipwreck was and we turned off our lights and we were waving our hands around because it agitates the light and spinning around and we were just making all this color and everything was just 3d surrounding you and we were both just laughing the whole time because it was such a euphoric experience just to see all these lights and um, that was really cool Another favorite dive of mine for wildlife in particular was in Nusa Penida in Bali. Uh, it's quite a famous site because the manta rays come to this particular mm. rock. It's like a feeding station for them. And I was horribly seasick on the boat journey over there. And the dive was really shallow. You're hanging out around 10 meters. Mm. And there was a big cliff face right next to the rock where the manta rays were. So the sea's bouncing off this cliff. So you're swimming just going around like a washing machine thing. Oh, I really hope that this is worth it. <laughs> and, and then out of this murk arrived all these manta rays and they were all around you yeah. and they're so big and they just look so majestic, mm. just gliding along. And that was amazing. And you don't need to move anywhere. You just stay in the same place the whole dive and enjoy the show. And one of them came towards me is just flying at my face. And I thought, what do I do? do I move out of its way or does it see me? Is it going to go around? What's the protocol here? Because you don't want to disturb them when they're feeding. And it just came really close and it swam right over my head. Like, wow, look at it, historic. And it was just so close to me that that was quite an emotional <laughs> moment for me. Okay. Um, but then the emotion changed a bit later on the dive. I turned around and there was another manta ray that was going over slightly further away this time. And I was looking up at it. And it just suddenly started to do this enormous poo. Oh, no. <laughs> and it was just this cloud of debris and it was coming right <laughs> towards me. And I thought, oh, I'll just swim backwards. I don't want to be swimming around this cloud of poo. And he just kept following me. And I was like, oh, oh well, I guess I'm <laughs> in this now. And at the same time, still feeling seasick. So that was fun. But manta rays are beautiful. Yeah. Another great wildlife spot mm. is Malapascua Island in the Philippines. Um, they have a resident population of thresher sharks. The thresher sharks have these really long whippy tails. They're quite small sharks, but the tails are massive. And you have to do the dive at sunrise because the sharks come up at nighttime and because it's safer for them. And then they go back down into the depths in the day. And I was taking a few days holiday and I had to start every day at about 20 past three in the morning. Mm. And the dives kept getting cancelled because of the weather. So you're disappointed and you're tired. And one dive we went on and there were no sharks. I was like, oh, no, I'm never going to get to see them. And then the final day of my holiday, I struck lucky and I found the thresher sharks and they were amazing. Mm -hmm. And I saw one off to my right in the distance. I thought, well, we can just go and swim a little bit closer over there. So we swam a bit closer to it. And they're quite shy creatures. So you, you don't want to get too close because you'll just scare them off. So there was a, a little pointy rock. It wasn't very tall, but I thought, oh, I'll just lie down here and then I can watch it. So I was just peering over this rock and the shark was 
quite curious. He was obviously also shy and he was just swimming and it's so, no, I don't want to go over there. Then it was swim back. No, I don't want to go over there and swim back. And, but it meant I got a full 360 profile yeah. of the shark because it was turning and it would just have this beautiful flappy tail. And they have these enormous black eyes that are so shiny and cute little mouths that really the most adorable shark that you could imagine. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> um, a non-ocean dive that was pretty life-changing for me was in Mexico um, I wasn't cave trained at this point so I was on a guided dive of some of the cenotes there we went to the first cenote we did was called the pit mm. it's very deep and steep it goes into a very deep cave system but the cenote dive is also deep it, it's about 36 meters and at the bottom of this part of the cenote, it's basically what used to be the roof of the cavern. So it's got a whole tree on there. It's got leaves and soil. And because it's decomposing in the water, it releases this uh, hydrogen sulfide gas. So you've got this huge cloud of gas and just prongs of the tree sticking out. And it's really spooky when you're just descending on top of it and you see this tree just come out of the cloud. So that... That was really cool to see. But what I really liked about this dive was at the back of the cavern, um, you can just see all these beams of light, proper straight beams of light, and they're bright blue. The water's so clear there. And it's just really beautiful to see. And you get this extra bit of decoration around the top of the cavern. So you have this silhouette of the decoration. So the stalagmites and stalactites, and then just background of this bright blue light and it was beautiful and the following day we went to a place called Dreamgate which is a highly decorated cavern and I thought oh this is just so beautiful and from then on I wanted to be a cave diver and I qualified 18 months later which is quite ironic because when I was learning to dive there was a dive master on my course and he told me this scary story of something bad that happened to him in a cave and I thought no I'm never going to be a tech diver we'll never go in a cave um but here we are <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that's incredible I asked for interesting stories and you've given me adorable thresher sharks um manta ray poo um majestic caverns and bioluminescence <laughs> like amazing <laughs> was not expecting all of that in one but I love it um so you've obviously been diving for years um have you noticed any changes to the ocean yeah uh, very noticeable changes to the ocean there was one dive in particular in the Philippines we were diving around this very small island very rocky you know it's not have, doesn't have anyone living on it and it had quite a high population of soft corals. Mm. And normally they should be standing quite proud from the wall and they should be a really nice vivid purple, but they looked like they'd all melted. They were just all sagged over. It literally looked like they were dripping off the rock and they were very pale. And I found that really upsetting to see. And something I've struggled with teaching people to dive or taking people on guided dives is you can go to a place that's maybe not that great for the coral. And these people, they've had the time of their lives because they've had a new experience. This might be their first ever dive on the reef. Mm. And they come out of the water and go, oh, that was so cool. Mm. We saw all that coral. And inside, I think, oh, well, that bit was dead. And that bit was covered in algae. And that mm. bit's bleached. That bit's diseased. And... Yeah, sometimes I do get upset underwater yeah. at, at what I'm seeing. And there is a general shift towards macroalgae. You can see where the coral reefs used to be. And, you know, diving with people who have been going to the same place for years, they'll tell you the changes. And that is at least a valuable experience for the students is when they see those things that I see from yeah. a different perspective. It helps me to talk to them about the impact of climate change mm. on the ecosystems that they're really interested in seeing as new divers. So I have to take it as a learning yeah. experience and rather than get depressed about it, I have I to take it as a wake up call for myself that we need to do more to protect these ecosystems and that yeah. I need to do more to protect these ecosystems. So it's sad, but you know, you, you can't get bogged down in that. It I should know. be driving you to make yeah. the change. No, I completely agree. Is the, um, so white coral 
is if it's been bleached, right? Yeah. And brown is if it's is that the one that's covered in the algae? If it's brown. So the algae gives coral its color anyway. Mm. Um, but when corals have been bleached, they'll expel the algae. So right. you're left with this white skeleton. Yeah. But when it's kind of browny green yeah. and it's got little tufts, yes. then that is when it's been covered by macroalgae. Oh, okay. I've seen that before, but I didn't know that's what it was. Um, and totally know what you mean. It's quite sad, but yeah. It just it's good to drive you on. Yeah. <laughs> to make it better. Um, so one of your main areas of research is on corals and um, ocean acidification. Um, so how important um, are they when it comes to measuring the health of the ocean? So corals are a bit like the canaries in the coal mine because they're very sensitive to lots of different environmental stresses. They're sensitive to ocean warming. Mm. So like we just talked about, they can get bleached when temperatures exceed one degrees above the mean monthly maximum for a prolonged period of time, you know, mm. over, over a week. Then the corals can expel the algae, but the algae make 90% of their energy. Mm. So the corals essentially starve mm. and they sit and you just see the white skeleton because the algae have gone. And the corals can recover from bleaching events, providing they don't last for too long. Then mm. there's the opportunity for the algae to come back. Um, but if the temperatures stay warm for too long, then the corals get covered over by macroalgae instead. Uh, corals are also sensitive to ocean acidification. And when they're in waters that are too acidic, they become more brittle. So you'll see corals that are more easily broken by storm damage. You can get rubble patches. And yeah. on x-rays, you can see that their skeletons become less dense as mm -hmm. well. They're also really sensitive to nutrient input and sediment input. Corals can get smothered by sediment and they make all this mucus yeah. to try and clean the sediment off them. And too many nutrients stimulates the macroalgae that will just grow over them quite yeah. quickly. Um, corals are also really good records of these kind of pollution events. Mm. Um, they store all this information in their skeletons. So you can get hundreds of years worth of records of things like acidification or changes in temperature. And you just map out this whole record of how climate has changed. So mm. they're really handy yeah, <laughs> little, little libraries. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, it's quite scary how quickly they can be impacted, really, um, especially when a lot of the time the damage is irreversible. Um, but I guess this varies um, depending on the type of coral or where the coral is actually found because they're quite diverse, aren't they? Yeah, so there's not one size fits all when it comes to talking about impacts on coral. Mm. Um, there's many different species of corals, different types of coral reefs, and, you know, they're in different regions of the world. So they have adapted over time in some places. For instance, the corals in the Persian Gulf, which is the warmest ocean in the world, those corals can withstand temperatures of 36 degrees on a sustained level and even up to 40 degrees, which is miraculous, really. Most other tropical corals will start to become at risk of bleaching around 30 degrees mm. maybe 32 in some places so you know they're not all made equal yeah exactly <laughs> um so back to ocean acidification um can you tell us what that is um and how do we measure it ocean acidification is a decrease in the ph of the ocean mm. so it's becoming more acidic and this happens because carbon dioxide that we emit dissolves into the ocean mm and it reduces the pH of the ocean. And the consequence of this on corals and other organisms that form shells, um, it reduces the number of calcium carbonate ions in the water and corals need those as building blocks to make mm -hmm. their skeletons. Mm -hmm. So as the pH decreases, so does the availability of those ions. And that's why they end up making less dense Right. Uh, skeletons or they grow more slowly but corals have a little bit of a fail-safe mechanism against this and um, they have a really neat response called ph upregulation and they can actually increase the ph of their calcifying fluid so right at the cellular level they can increase the ph to make conditions more favorable mm. for uh, precipitation of calcium carbonate 
but that costs them a lot of energy. So the problem with ocean acidification, I mean, it's a problem in and of itself. But when corals are dealing with other stresses that we described, like mm. bleaching or nutrification, sedimentation, it leaves the corals with less energy to fight against this problem yeah. of ocean acidification. Mm. So we can measure ocean acidification by analyzing the pH of the seawater or total alkalinity or dissolved in organic carbon, partial pressure of CO2 and aragonite saturation state. These are all parameters that form part of the carbonate system. And the really tidy thing about the carbonate system is if you measure just two of those parameters, you can actually calculate all the other ones, oh, which is really handy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, traditionally, we take samples of the seawater and then measure those things in the lab. Mm. But now we're moving more towards making these measurements autonomously. So we can perform those lab techniques on sensors and Amazing. you can get different types of sensors. And the advantage of sensors is you can leave them in the water for a long time. Mm. So you get a much higher resolution data set mm. either in terms of time mm -hmm. or in terms of your 3D space, you know, you can put them on moving platforms mm -hmm. like gliders and submarines, mm -hmm. ROVs, and they're going up and down yeah. side to side. You're covering a much wider area. Yeah. And you can obviously stick them out on moorings for years at a time. Mm. Yeah, so you obviously work a lot with sensors, don't you? So, <laughs> um, have you got any examples of like where you've used these? Yeah, so I work with mostly pH and TA mm -hmm. sensors and we've deployed them as part of the Commonwealth Marine Economies program mm -hmm. in small island developing states such as Belize, Fiji, Tuvalu, Dominica. And we donated ocean acidification kits mm -hmm. to government units on these islands like mm -hmm. fisheries departments. Yeah. And the ocean acidification kits included a pH sensor, mm -hmm a CTD, so that measures salinity, temperature, and depth, and a telemetry unit so that we could live stream the data. Yeah. But this was part of a capacity building program. So we donate the equipment and also provide them with training, how to deploy the equipment, how to take care of it, and how to process the data afterwards. And the beauty of this project is that everything belongs to them. So they can choose where is best to put it and how to use the data. So Belize used theirs as part of forming their um, marine economies plan. Great. Um, but they can also upload the data to meet their UN sustainable development goals because measuring long-term ocean acidification mm -hmm. is one of those targets. So yeah. it helps them to meet that. Yeah, so awesome. I, I really enjoyed that because yeah. I, I like making science accessible Definitely. to people that don't have these resources yes. at their hands. Um, a more traditional oceanography example is last year we deployed 10 biogeochemical sensors on the Rapid East Mooring Array. Mm -hmm. So that included pH and TA sensors. And the Rapid Mooring Array is a long term, it's been going for over 20 years. It's a string of moored instruments across mm -hmm. 26 degrees north in the North Atlantic. Traditionally, they measure physical oceanographic parameters, but in the last few years, there's been a real push to increase the number of biogeochemical instruments. Yeah. So we put pH and TA sensors on the moorings there between 50 and 3,000 meters, mm -hmm. and they're going to operate there for two years. Amazing. And while we were there, we deployed some on CTD cast down to 5,000 meters. Cool. So got a real big coverage. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and just to finish off then, um, what about now? Are you working on anything interesting at the moment or anything coming up? Yeah, so obviously I'm really excited to go and pick up the sensors from the Rapid Array in March and see what kind of gems they're going to find for us after they've been logging for so long. Mm. But I'm also really curious to find out more about mesophotic reefs. Mm -hmm. So these are, are deep water reefs and I feel like a lot of assumptions have been made about the chemistry that happens around them. So it'd be great if we can just go and measure it and yeah. see what the carbon system's mm. doing down there. <laughs> and looking at blue carbon ecosystems. So for example, how planting seagrass beds near to corals might help to protect them against ocean acidification. Yeah.
Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been thank really you. great to have you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. If you're enjoying Into the Blue, please make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. New episodes are released every other Wednesday on all major platforms and are also available to watch on the NOC's YouTube. See you next time.